those who maybe don't know about Bill and don't know about Newfoundland, I did my PhD at Memorial University, and Bill was there when I did my PhD, and he was doing amazing work on birds then, and he is still doing amazing work on birds, and uh, tonight he's going to talk to us about light pollution in the night sky and the effects that it has on seabirds in particular. So, Bill, over to you. All right. Well, um, yeah, here we go. Um, I, I know, uh, you know, I, I'm in uh, Newfoundland. Um, so I'm really going to talk primarily about things that are happening here. But this is a global problem. And um, I think we all are involved with it in some way or another. And really what we're, you know, and, and even this whole notion, uh, you know, the, the, I know we have people online like Aram, who's, who's an expert, uh, you know, a global expert on light pollution. But I know oftentimes when I talk to people here, um, they don't even know that there's such a thing as light pollution or what is light pollution. And it's something we, I think we just tend to take for granted. Um, and, and really what we're talking about, we're not even, for the most part, talking about light that's useful or effective, but we're talking about, you know, unpurposed light, extraneous light, light that we create that does nothing of use except go into the sky, uh, mask what, what's up there, the stars and whatever, and it has huge, <clears throat> huge consequences for um for animals, uh, you know, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I just had one quickie. Uh, if people didn't know where uh, Newfoundland was and with South Africa, where Derek and some of you folks are, you know, it's a diagonal across the Atlantic. So we're up here in the Northwest and you guys are way down here in the Southeast, as you probably know, <laughs> I just want to show you where we are. Um, but yeah, so there's this notion of uh, light pollution that, you know, people tend to not think about it. But here's here's why it's so important. Um, you know, all, all life on Earth, all life on Earth evolved in a day-night cycle. So that means that night is pretty important. Even, you know, even if night for us meant just shutting down and, you know, sleeping or hiding or whatever, uh, you know, there's so many animals uh, that are nocturnal. Uh, you think about plants and their relationship with the sun, with the relationship with night. and so we, you know, if you put it in that context, and then you put it in the context of what we are doing, we, we, we are, you know, essentially erasing night, we're taking it out of the equation, and we're, we're limiting it, you know, and there's all kinds of statistics about how much, how many people can actually see the, you know, the Milky Way, or how many people can see the night sky, and it's it's incredible how many people cannot is is the fact of the matter. And if you're in a big city, um, you probably can't see much of it. And uh, it's quite remarkable. And, and those things that we're talking about, I mean, those are navigational signals. They've been navigate, you know, they've been navigational signals for you know millennia. And um, you know, for birds, for turtles, for all kinds of animals. So um, it's it's a real concern. And the other thing that seems so straightforward about it, although I, 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 I'm not very optimistic, um, the way we go, once the technology kicks in, it just seems we just keep it rolling. But it, it is uh, tractable. You know, I mean, we talk about climate change, and we know that's a massive effect. It's hard to know you know, what kind of contributions we can make. I mean, we know them on, you know, fairly large scales, what needs to be done. But the interesting thing about light, it could be really simple to solve the problem. I mean, you just have to flip the switch. You know, you just, we can turn them off. We can shield them. Uh, so we have all kinds of options, um, most of which we don't take, unfortunately. But pretty soon we're going to have to because it's getting to be non-sustainable. And, you know, this night light 
Um, I mean, it also has effects, you know, on us. I mean, it affects, uh, you know, melatonin in the brain and day, you know, sleep cycles. And, and it's been linked to all kinds of, uh, you know, lack of, uh, you know, dark has been linked to all kinds of human, um, you know, problems and diseases. I mean, there's, there's a, a list, quite a list. So, so it's in our best interest to deal with it. Um, and you know, and pretty much that the system existed, you know, the natural system of day and night existed. And so we, you know, actually pre-hominids, this is an estimate of three, three uh, hundred thousand years ago, you know, began using light on a daily basis, fire on a daily basis. So that would have been the first time that night started to change. And clearly, you know, it's clearly advantageous to us to have light at night. It's clearly advantageous to be active at night. In this case, it was advantageous to, uh, you know, fire was also kept people alive. Uh, it kept uh, predators away. So it did lots of things, but that's when it started. But it's really only been, you know, in the past century and maybe a bit more where our light has just been increasing astronomically. You know, every year the the estimates are, you know, 6% more than the year before. So it's just going in a state that, uh, that there's real concerns about, um, you know, the, the, the nighttime and, 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 and the effect it has. And primarily, well, not primarily, but from my point of view, I, you know, it is a primary concern. It's birds. And, you know, these are storm petrels. Um, they're like, you know, many of the shear waters that, uh, you know, are around South Africa, throughout the Atlantic. Um, it's these birds that are active at night that are, you know, a light attracted. And, you know, it's, just, it's a paradox in a way. The, the paradox is that animals that are active at night are attracted to light. And, you know, we know that moths at street lights, uh, bats at street lights, uh, all kinds of, you know, interactions with lighting, but, you know, lots of other animals as well that aren't, don't fly like turtles and, you know, just so many nocturnal animals in the forest. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a big concern. And, the sources, you know, I mean, you know, lighthouses and, you know, lighthouses are actually phasing out. So, and, but there used to be, you know, lots of bird kills at lighthouses and, and people learned quickly that if the light was a constant beam, it was much more attractive than if it was an intermittent beam. And, and so, um, there's ways to to mitigate and make situations better, even without having that situation go away. But this with lighthouses, the situation is going away. We essentially GPS and all those controls just allow you know vessels to uh, to navigate, and there's no great need. Uh, for lighthouses uh, as we go. And, and, and here's another, well, here, here are all of them, you know, um, coastal lighting. I mean, that's just incrementing all the time. Uh, luring, you know, luring marine animals in, but, you know, animals that are in, on land, uh, luring them as well. And again, because I focus on seabirds, we look at offshore lighting and so you know hydrocarbon platforms that we have in eastern Canada in the ocean that was you know essentially opaque until you know 20 or 30 years ago and now with these lights and these flares um, it's completely changed the dark ocean environment on the environmental shelf and that's such an important place for some of these birds that were talking about petrels and shearwaters, and, and now it's 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 lit up, and and those birds are looking for bioluminescent prey, and you know who knows how this is going to affect what they're doing. And we know, I'll tell you what we do know. We know they get attracted to these lights. We know that they crash into these platforms the same way that was happening with lighthouses. 
and you know they get there and then it all these structures also attract gulls the gulls prey on the birds that are attracted there and um you know, it's just, it's a tough situation and a situation that never existed before. So there's probably no, you know, real evolutionary adaptation that the birds have, um, you know, to the artificial light. And, and there's so many miscues and misorientation and strandings. And so the best we can do, and we can do it. I mean, this, this particular platform, it's like every one that we have, and we've got about five on the on the shelf edge in Newfoundland, they're lit up like this. Almost all of that light is non-functional. Um, you know, the lights here, we, you know, people, they don't even put, pull the blinds on the windows, you know? I mean, just totally non-functional. This is the flare over here, it's not going, uh, but I'll show you some more, but you know, it's, it, this doesn't have to be, it can be, totally functional with about a third of that light. The light could be different weight, different color, and uh, much less of an issue. And then the other thing that's always been there, you know, we, we have, you know, fishing boats, tourism boats, um, tankers, uh, cargo ships, and, and they're all really well lit up. And, but a lot of that lighting isn't necessary either. And what's happening in all of these places, this is big change is we're changing uh, to this uh, LED, um, uh, you know, um, lighting, which is, you know, super bright. And, uh, it, you, you know, we can control it a bit more. We get this super bright light. And so even, you know, if you look at a street light, I mean, around here, all those orange sort of glowing street lights are turning into things that look more like heat lamps and that would be brilliant uh, white light. So constant change, constant brightening, you know, ratcheting up potential problems for humans and, and for wildlife and in particular for seabirds in the marine environment. And I want to show you why we, this is in my lab, we, I, I've got a number of students and we do a lot of research with birds, um, but sometimes things just jump out at us that we, you know, we almost can't ignore and we don't. Um, this is a long-term you know, 50 year or more uh, cycle of this little bird. This, 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 if you don't know leeches, storm petrels, they're about the size of a robin, but they're, but they're like, they're little albatrosses. And, and so they can go from their colonies, you know, off the coast of Newfoundland to the Grand Banks, and they can fly, you know, 500 kilometers uh, in a round trip to just, you know, feed or go get food for their chicks. I mean, and, and, and then the, you know, the migration of these birds, some of these birds are uh, from Newfoundland, they'll be off of Namibia, uh, they'll be off of uh, South Africa, um, working their way in, in, in our winter and your summer, uh, some of these birds will be down your way, uh, just as some of your shearwaters, um, you know, in, in your winter are up our way during our summer. But anyway, so here's this little bird, and, and I, when I first came here, I mean, I, I, everybody's enamored with them. They nest in the millions on islands. Uh, they nest in little burrows, uh, like little mouse holes, and, and they're just everywhere. So this is the first island I ever worked on. It's Bakalu. I'll show you a picture. Um, you know, Basque word for cod as the Basque came to fish in North America. Um, but here's their population over about 60 years. And, and you can see it, and this is about 30 years, 40 years, it, we've lost just, just in this one colony, which happens to be the largest colony in the world, um, we've lost about a million and a half to 2 million birds. And, and these, when, when animals are this abundant, it's one really, really difficult to track population change. But the other thing to realize and to really be concerned about is abundance and extinction really don't have that tight of a relationship. I mean, what we know in North America 
as being the most abundant bird, and it might have been one of the most abundant birds in the world, was the passenger pigeon. And you know, there are descriptions of the sky being blackened for days as the birds migrated. Well, there's no passenger pigeons now. I mean, and it wasn't because it was a rare species. Um, and that's not uncommon. I mean, with fish, um, there's so many things you can think of. And I'm sure there's lots of African examples of animals that were really, really abundant. And, you know, you get to a tipping point, there have to be a lot of them. And that's, that's the concern because animals like this, they have a really strong social fabric and you get to a tipping point really fast. And if they don't have enough of that social fabric to give them information about food, to give them enough diversity for who they can mate with, um, protection from predators, all kinds of things like that that are socially uh, involved sort of commitments, um, then those kind of species can just disappear. Anyway, so here was our concern. There's millions of them. And now, and, and you, you wouldn't know. I mean, we still got millions of them. And, you know, people in the coastal communities where the birds come in, they go, oh yeah, they've always been here. We got millions of them. But the fact of the matter is when you lose we, here's the fact of the matter is we, you know, this is the largest in the world. This would have been about 10 million birds on this island. Those are pairs. So you double that, you get 6.6, .6, you know, million, 6.6 uh, .6 .6 million birds. And you add a chick for every one of those. Well, you're up to 10 million birds. And now we're down to maybe 6 million. So we're missing like 4 million birds and we're missing it in a, period of just a few decades, you know, like about 30 years, and bang. And now there are all these hypotheses about, well, why, what's happening to this population? Well, there's pollution, there's plastic, there's climate change, uh, the habitat's changing because of climate, there's predation, and there's light. And we, we, we've no, these things are, you know, they're not independent. We know some of these other things are important, but, we, you know, we think, uh, and we're focused on light primarily um, because this population decline is, is coincident with offshore lighting. Now, here's, here's a, a, you know, a, a flare in the offshore where we are. Those flares came online, that were those platforms came online, the first one, about 30 years ago. And so this bird, the storm petrel, which is the most vulnerable seabird to light in the Northwest Atlantic, its population decline is coincident with, with the flaring and the lights in the Grand Bank. So it's a correlation, and there's probably a lot of things going on. But we know, you know, there, there just hundreds of birds show up here every year and they show up you know on land they show up on boats they show up in other places but anyway we know that so right away if without knowing any cause we just know that light's important so that's where we focused our research on those birds and here's here's a very particular place where we're working um and this is this is the largest seafood processing plant in Canada, uh, it's huge. Um, you know, that wall of that fish plant is, oh, I don't know, it's maybe almost a kilometer long and it's completely brightly lit. Storm petrels come in there at night. Uh, they, they're, you know, they're attracted to the light, disoriented, but they end up hitting the wall, they fall down. Well, the gulls that are there are well aware of it. There's a patrol of gulls. There's cats that come there and get the, the stranded birds. There's, oh, we've had otter, rats, foxes, um, you know, all kinds of critters. Uh, in the morning, the crows will show up. So anyway, this is a huge, so we, we started doing some research here because one, what's really important is that largest colony in the world that's gone down by 4 million in 30 years is right over the hill. And I can show you in the next slide, This here's the fish plant we were just looking at. And, and there's Bakalu Island. Um, again, the, the, you know, the species largest colony. 
and, and you know, and this distance is, you know, about four or five kilometers. So mm -hmm. it's really close and the, and the birds are attracted in here at night. So, so this was a good place to go um, and, and start the research. And what we found was, um, you know, so what, and actually I should tell you the, um, the fish plant uh, owner, the fish plant manager, I just walked in one day. I, I just, I don't know what it was. I just looked at the size of that thing. I just looked at all the lights and I just said, geez. And I just walked in and, and asked if I could meet with the, uh, with the manager. And, I, you know, and I mean, I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and they said, well, do you have an appointment? And I said, no. And and they said, well, you, you, know, you can meet with a manager. And I said, look, you know, this is really an issue. Do you think we can do something with these lights? And they said, yeah, sure. I mean, these guys were so helpful. And so they immediately turned them off and we, we had the lights off. Well, you know, lights are there for safety. So I don't want to over exaggerate. Lights are there for safety. So the agreement was the lights would be off except when boats came in, you know, fishing boats to unload their catch. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, of course, it's there for safety. But we got, I would say we got three quarters of the lights turned off and then one quarter would turn back on when the fishing boats came in. But anyway, even in that process, and so we had a partial shutdown of lighting, but in that simple process of, people just agreeing to do that. Um, the number of birds that hit that wall, you know, many of whom would have been killed uh, or, in the, or sometimes they get injured hitting the wall, you know, just dropped by almost 50%. And it was pretty, pretty straightforward and pretty simple to do, which was really a good feeling because now we've finished our research and we have a rationale um, and so there's lots of fish plants in Canada. There's lots of fish plants in Newfoundland. And I'm working with another fish plant on the Northeast Coast. And, and I've talked to the manager and, and, and he's willing to shut down um, the lights. And there are particular times when the lights, it's most important to shut them down. And we'll look at that in a minute. But um, it's really kind of interesting that, uh, that you can... Um, you, sometimes you can make a difference uh, with uh, an intervention that people uh, just help with. And that's always surprising to me because every, it always seems like it's a struggle to, uh, to do, you know, most things we try in conservation, but uh, this, this worked pretty good. The other thing that um, showed up, which is very interesting, um, is that the more, moonlight there was the fewer um the fewer birds actually uh would would come into those lights at the fish plant this is this notion of when there's uh you know a lot of natural light um from from in this case lunar illumination uh that the birds are less likely um, to be disoriented by, you know, the artificial light that we create. And this is a pretty widespread uh, phenomenon um, that, you know, fewer uh, birds come in uh, when there's a full moon. So that's, that, that was, it's very interesting as well to just figure out what's going on, but it's telling you how tuned in uh, the animals are to the natural, to the natural light cycles. And uh, this didn't even, oh, there it is. Um, and, and there are certain times. So the, these are days of the year and these are birds um, that are stranded. And th these dates here, this, this block. So, you know, you can see there's, a, you know, there's a tonic kill of birds throughout the year, but primarily during the birds breeding season over the summer. And then at the end of the summer, um, here in the, in the autumn, in September and October, uh, the young birds all come out. And at that time, um, there's much more mortality. And it's primarily young birds, um, birds most likely on their maiden flight. They, a little bird comes out of a bird, comes out by itself or herself. 
never been to see before and just takes off. There's no parental guidance. The bird just goes. And so it certainly is susceptible. And there are lots of reasons why they might be susceptible. They certainly are susceptible to um, disorientation and stranding from artificial illumination. So, and we find that. And we find that. And so, you know, young birds have huge mortality. Um, you know, most of them die uh, before they ever get to maturity. Uh, huge, you know, huge uh, rates of mortality as those birds are are growing over the years. And, and most of that mortality is when they first, you know, first go to sea. But but there's all but there is also adult mortality. And you know, these numbers look low. But some of these numbers are really kind of significant because there's no young birds here. You know, they just start fledging in September, um, leaving their nest. But, you know, back here, th this adult mortality is really, really significant. And it's variable, but it's significant because, you know, it takes these birds maybe four years to be, you know, to get to adult mature, maturity. Um, and then once the bird is an adult, it, it has the experience, the breeding experience. And so it takes a while to figure out, you know, how to raise young, where, you know, get the food offshore and, you know, get all that together. And when you lose an adult, you lose something, you know, that's really more significant for the population and particularly a breeding adult, because one, it's gonna take a young bird that survives you know, three or four years to get to be an adult. But the other thing is, is the, the chicks are dependent, really dependent on having two parents. And if one parent dies, uh, essentially every time you've got a dead parent, you've essentially got a dead chick. They, they, there might be a few exceptions to that, but usually a dead adult means a dead chick. So we're concerned about all the mortality and we really track this adult mortality, but it's the young birds that, you know, and over time, um, these colossal, uh, you know, fatalities among young birds certainly can have a population effect. And, you know, we just looked at that population decline, um, you know, in the, in the past 30 years. And I, I just want to mention something because I, yeah I, I, before I go to boats I do want to mention something because here's here's a mitigation that we could do since we know this bird is the most attracted bird to offshore platforms and since we know that they always go to sea and essentially in October and since there's a requirement for these platforms to re, you know, the flare is the most important safety mechanism on that platform. You know, it's, it's, it gets, you know, gas pressure shooting out and, you know, it's a safety mechanism for the people working on the platform. So it's really important, but because it's important, it has to be shut down and refit and inspected once a year because it's so hot and it's in a salty, misty, wet environment. So you get lots of cracks in the uh, in the structure of the flare, and which is dangerous. So they have to shut it down and they have to refit it and check it once a year. Well, it's simple enough to simply say, well, why don't we just do that in October? And if we did that in October, we would save tens of thousands of birds. So we've made that proposal a number of times. Um, it, it's completely ignored. We'll keep making it. The other thing you can do with flaring is you can re-inject the gases back into the well, which is mostly what they do in, in lots of jurisdictions like the US. And so flaring is really the archaic way to, to produce oil. And you know, oil production is getting such bad press these days anyway, but you know it's going to keep going for a while, it, it has to keep going at least for some time, but um, but it could be re-injected. You know, there's the World Bank has resolutions to do this. The United Nations has resolutions um, 
when new platforms go out, the and even for the old ones, the objectives are to re-inject and you know eliminate flaring. But again, these regulations, they don't, you know, they're not required. And uh, it's uh, it's just a corporate, I mean, to my mind, it's just really kind of a corporate elitism that uh, allows them to do this and, and, and we accept it. Um, uh, so here's a, you know, here's a, here's a typical fishing boat. And uh, this is that fish plant there. You can see some of the length of it in the lights, but so we, but we also want to look at birds on, on vessels. So Aram who's, who's joined us um, and he's a scientist uh, from Spain and he, he's done huge amount of work on these issues and a lot of it is directed at coastal um, lighting and and that's really important it, it you know takes a lot of birds out but what we look what we see is really data gaps are you know the offshore platforms and and fishing vessels so we we've also tried to focus a lot of our attention here and you can see this kind of lighting um, on the boat and is that necessary? Um, it seems like it's quite a bit excessive. Um, boats can run with, you know, simpler red and green running lights and uh, and not have to do that. But anyway, so we're, we're working on that. And, um, but what we've noticed is, is one, there's the shift in lighting to the new LEDs. Um, um you know that are just got everything you know totally brilliantly lit but and this is just to show you how uh and this is just recent you know this is about well recent it's it's probably about 50 years and in newfoundland um we fished out all the cod you know essentially we fished it out you know is you know basically you know why it could have been the you know settlement of North America from the the Basques and the Portuguese and everybody that came here in the 1500s um, to fish. Well, we, we well that fishery has essentially been overfished. And what happened when the cod got taken out? This is this is a classic example of what's called um, you know feeding down on the food web. So the the cod were gone. But to the benefit of the fishermen, and it's been a huge benefit, the cod were eating crab, and the crab has just come back in a much higher price than cod ever was. And then the, the crab have come back, you know, sort of cod food. Crab, the cod are gone, so the crab take off. And this shows the number of, uh, well, this is just harvest of crab in Newfoundland, but this is a reflection. So look, the the fishery here was closed in 1992, right in there. And ever since then, here's, here's the catches of crab over the, you know, the next 20 years. And it's just astronomical. And so what's happened is those smaller, you know, fishing boats that fish during the day for cod are now fishing at night and traveling at night for crab. So some of their fishing is during the day, but they make long trips. So they're always out at night. Uh, if they're not fishing, they're traveling. And so we've changed the lightscape. I mean, that's how fast we can do it. We've totally changed the lightscape with the boats in, in the past 20 years as a consequence of the fishery. So we are, we're studying this. Now you in South Africa, this is, uh, I think Tristan de Kuna, and this is a boat, I'm trying to think, it it, uh, it comes alongside of the island, and some people here probably know, I'm trying to remember, they unload, uh, they're often, I, I don't know if they're unloading fish or other uh, material from the island, but they'll often, you know, essentially park there for long periods of time, and while well, they're loading or unloading, and, and they're usually brilliantly lit up. Well, you know, some people, uh, Peter Ryan, John Cooper, um, you know, did some studies, you know, kind of like we're, we're doing now at Newfoundland and showed when the lights are on, there's a lot of birds just dying, you know, shear waters 
uh, banging into this boat, being stranded, getting greased, and dying. And they were, you know, effective enough to get the governments of, uh, I think these are the local governments of Tristan de Cunha and Gough Island. Um, I think Tristan de Cunha, but somebody maybe knows, but in fact, they have government regulation um, that that minimizes the lighting of this, these boats. So they can't be brilliantly lit up when they're there at night. And I'm not even sure they're working at night. They're just sitting there. And that's a tremendous, uh, that's a tremendous simple thing of turning off the lights, but but regulating it so you have to turn off the lights. We often have offshore support vessels or even drill rigs that are lit up like that platform that are in coastal bays in, 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 our, in Newfoundland and uh, they're brilliantly lit up and we have no regulation. So this, this has always been, you know, very encouraging to see uh, that, you know, that it can be done and it's so straightforward. Um, so we, we running experiments. Again, this is Bakalu Island and we run experiments where we run part of the island with a light on and then these are circumnavigation. This island's about 10, um, about 10 kilometers long. So it takes us, you know, depending on uh, the speed of the boat, it takes us about, um, oh, I don't know, maybe an hour or a little bit more to make a circumnavigation. We run with lights on, on one side, we get to the other side, we turn lights off and then we reverse. So we're running on, off, off, on. Um, and we've done that a bunch of times to try and, so what we're trying to show is, um, again, that simple demonstration that we get more birds when the lights are on than when they're off. And and this is an ongoing project. It's, it's a master's uh, students project right now. But what we know is if we just show the number of birds, and these are really low numbers, but it's, it's just striking. Um, when we show the number of birds that are dead, uh, on a boat or collided on a boat, um, you know, I think we've got 13 or 14 or whatever, it, it's cut and dry. You know, you get them when the lights are on and you don't get them when the lights are off. So it, it's good rationale that if you don't need those lights, uh, you don't need to have them on. And, and it's even a bit more complicated than that for the storm petrels. Like I, I said, they're small, but so that because they're small, the the gulls are also attracted to the light and the gulls come in and they prey and kill the storm petrels. So, you know, the storm petrels get it, you know, get everything thrown out. They can hit the boat. They can, you know, collide in the boat. They can get injured. They can get greased on the boat. And even just in the light around the boat, when they're flying around, there's, there's flocks of gulls out there that are just killing them on the wing. Um, so it's a grim situation and lots of good reason to, to turn the lights out. And the other thing we're hoping to do, again, something like uh, maybe you, you can think about on Tristan de Cunha, we want to see, well, could we maybe get a buffer? Um, so we, the, the, so far the, the, circumnavigations that we've run we've stayed one kilometer off the island and we're going to use some two and three uh kilometer circumnavigations to just see um well maybe we can have a regulation that you don't go within three kilometers of the island and you'd be less likely to attract birds we don't know that we don't know the distance but we're gonna we're gonna test it anyway so it's kind of an ongoing project and uh, yeah, to establish a buffer. And, and this is what we're doing right now. Like I'm going out um, in the area on Friday to talk to fishermen um, to, you know, to actually give them notebooks and ask them to count whenever they get, you know, a bird on the boat. And these guys are fishing. So that's the totally first priority. So we have to get fishermen who really, one, think it's not silly and are willing to do it. But there are a few guys like that out there. And um, 
you know, and they'll probably do their fishing and then afterwards make some assessment of how many birds and where they were. But we're, we're you know, we're trying just to maximize the information about boats with with lights on and boats with lights off. And then, you know, um, just kind of ends up, well, what can we do? You know, well, the, you know, it's funny, it seems so complicated. Well, we can turn lights off. You know, it somehow it doesn't seem to be an issue. Even where we work at the fish plant, uh, we and we get the lights turned off at the fish plant. Well, there's wharf lights, and they're no more necessary than the plant lights when there's no boats in there, you know? And uh, so one year, the harbor master actually did turn off the wharf lights for us. But then the next year, there were so many boats in the harbor, he said he didn't think it was safe. Um, but there are ways to, 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 you know, simply shut off lights, but also, you know, you can shield lights. So, you know, a street light like that doesn't project light upward. But I mean, I just get back. We were in uh, San Diego, um, my wife and I, in California a few weeks ago, and there was something about it. It was kind of like a dark city. I, I, I oftentimes would be walking at night, and it was tremendous. There was it was just dark, you know. And the, and these were on major streets. Um, it was just dark. It was like fantastic, and. And there's also other ways, you know, the lots of places. We I don't know any here in Newfoundland, but places in Canada and places elsewhere where you have these light on demand thing. Um, you know, if the, if there's a car coming, um, there's a detector that turns on the light, and when the car's gone or a person's walking, the you know goes by, the light goes off. So. Um, there are lots of things that can be done and, and lots of work with the wavelengths um, in those lights. And, you know, there's rescue campaigns where people, uh, you know, there's a number of them here. People go out and uh, pick up stranded birds. It, it saves them. Um, and so that seems to be popular. And and basically what we're doing right now, you know, is is just talking about it with uh with everybody so people so to, just to get it on the radar screen um and people can think about it and maybe have opportunities to act on it um and you know so these these would basically be our objectives we know it's just incrementing we can turn we can turn so many of them off you know so many businesses have these brilliant signs you know, at four o'clock in the morning, I can't imagine it's going to really attract a lot of customers um, and really isn't necessary. And then, you know, it's just so look, you, you get this saves money. It cuts down really on, uh, you know, on wasted energy and, you know, in the, you know, essentially cuts down on greenhouse gases if you're just not using the energy. Uh, and and the basic thing is like just get rid of the you know unpurposed extraneous light. I mean, it does us no good. Why do we have it? It's non-functional. Um, and then the flaring thing is kind of a big deal. That that would help a lot, uh, as well as the refits. The uh, LED lights can be modified uh, in terms of intensity and wavelength to actually minimize their attractive qualities. Um, and so, and, and probably the best thing of all is, you know, I, it was that neat example at uh, Tristan de Kuna where you can actually regulate lighting. And, and we, you know, there's lots of cities in Canada and the US where there are regulations for how much lighting um, and, you know, and, and, you know, essentially restrictions on um, basically on excessive lighting. So, so there are lots of things um, that are possible. And then, uh, uh, so that, that's it really. And um, the, um, yeah, that's just my grandkids. And we're actually we're feeding a uh, stranded storm petrel. So, there you have it. <laughs> I, I don't know, Derek, what uh, you want to do. Oh, uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, yeah. 
Um, that was really interesting. And uh, I, I was um, prepared, uh, as I sometimes do in these webinars, because I have other things to do. And uh, I was prepared to do something else on the side of my desk. And I just was wrapped. I didn't uh, stop listening even for one second. So really good presentation. And I appreciate it very much. So people, if you have um, any questions, please just uh, pop them into the chat um, and we'll pick them up. Um, I don't know what has happened to the chat now. It seems to have disappeared for me. Oh, here we go. I found it. Um, someone is at uh, 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 Jim. Let me just get this sorted out here. I've got one of these situations where I know I have to mouse over something to make the chat bigger and uh, it doesn't respond. So anyway, uh, do, do strikes increase when it is cloudy? Uh, presumably the full moon would not help to reduce the disorientation. I think that's what the question's asking. Yeah, um, yes. Um, you know, cloud, um, in fog tend to increase um, the attraction and the stranding. And, and th that tends to happen because it, it masks um, the natural lighting. So um, yeah, that, and we, we try to study that. And, uh, and I didn't show anything um, there about that, but in fact, um, you know, we, I'm trying to think, I don't think we've actually got that effect. I think we did get, we did get a fog effect, but it, sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. It definitely seems like when there's fog, there's definitely more um, stranding in attraction. And, and uh, that relates to cloud cover as well, because it, it takes out the, the natural lighting. So yeah, that enhances uh, the attraction. The other thing it does when you look at something like a, offshore platform it uh it actually increases the globe you know the globe of light uh that's around that platform all the water molecules i think they refract the light and you end up with a bigger sphere of light um in a in a foggy condition than you would uh in in a clearer drier condition so yeah and it and presumably, uh, the birds don't need a lot of light to be attracted to it because, I mean, if they're if they're using natural light at night, um, you know, pre uh, our arrival on the scene, um, they would be able to detect very, relatively small amounts of light. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, that may be the case. I mean, maybe they just have. Look, I know. Look, even in situations where we have no light. Um, our situations in Newfoundland where it's really dark, and I, I think this is generalizable beyond Newfoundland, we often get strandings of birds when it's foggy and in places where there's no light. So there's, the birds definitely can get disoriented um, in the fog. Um, and, and, you know, as, and you're right, that's something that naturally would have occurred. Um, but in fact, uh, yeah, it's a circumstance that can create can create issues for them. And then when you couple that with the artificial light, um, it can be more of a problem, I think. Uh, Caroline is in um, the Netherlands, says, great tips to share. Thank you. I have heard about experiments with different colors of light, green, red, blue. Does it make any difference? For the birds yeah and um yeah it does and uh, again arms uh on on the line here um he might want to say something about that but yeah it does um and it can and you know there have been actually I even think it was in the netherlands where they um they, they had a drill rig in the netherlands and they actually um they put all green lighting on it and uh and the thought was that it would restrict uh, and limit and reduce the attraction of birds. It was a really interesting experiment, but I think subsequently that's been kind of rejected. And what it looks like, it's the longer 
red or orange or wavelengths that um, appear probably less attractive than the shorter blues and greens. And so, and, and there are, but yes, absolutely right that um and and i think that's you know i mean i know that's the subject of a lot of research right now and uh people are trying those kind of things to and and with the led lights you can um manipulate the outputs so um yeah that's a big deal and because lighting is not probably going to go away or be reduced over time that's probably going to be a major major mitigation on uh you know trying to help solve the problem is is to you know do wavelength experiments so some people here actually doing that testing different wavelengths and attraction of birds and um yeah i think that's really a big deal and i think we'll probably see more of that in time so Katia from uh, uh, Portugal uh, is says that she's with BirdLife Portugal and um, they're um, currently developing a conservation project addressing light pollution on uh, Macronesia region and its effects on seabirds, bats, and insects. Um, and she shares a web uh, a website. So if anybody wants to have a look, um, she's put the website link in the chat. So please feel free to grab the link and go have a look. Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. Uh, you know, it's um, that's great because there really is a lot happening. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about this part of the world. When I first came to South Africa in, in 1989, um, the coastline of South Africa was relatively dark. And now there is almost nowhere where the coastline is dark. A few nature reserves on the coast. But other than that, people live everywhere. You know, and and uh, and those people have their bright lights shining out into the water. So I I, I think it, it it should be something that's interesting here. I wonder if anyone is working on it in South Africa. I have I've not actually heard anything, but I think I'm I'm going to ask uh, um, uh, friends at BirdLife South Africa if there's anyone working on it here because it seems like something that uh, would be would be having an impact because we do have a lot of seabirds around here. <coughs> Yeah, you know, I, I just mentioned, you know, the uh, Tristan de Kuna regulation. I mean, that's 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 impressive, you know, and um, and those things could be done. I, I don't know any more about ongoing activity in uh, South Africa, but maybe somebody does. Yeah, I think we'll find out. Um, anybody else got questions? Uh If not, I'm 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 going to say thank you very much, Bill. It was great to see you again after so many years. Uh, we 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 both not the, as young as we used to be, but we still we're still cracking it. That's it. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. And uh, thank everybody for uh, tuning in. That was great. And um, yeah, all the best. Yeah, we had 20, 29 people. Flip, flip the switch. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Cool. Take care and thanks again. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. All the best. All the best. All the best, everyone.